So what is a 19th century law about corn, a volcanic eruption in Indonesia, and the Irish? I have to teach us about the old adage that politics makes for strange bedfellows. Well, in 1813, the House of Commons began to consider a law banning all foreign-grown corn. And following the end of the Napoleonic Wars, Parliament passed the 1815 Corn Law, which was essentially a very high tariff on any foreign produced wheat, barley, oats, corn, etc. But in 1816, the short-sightedness of this policy was made apparent when the Mount Tambora eruption in Indonesia triggered what is known as a year without a summer. With food imports effectively banned by the previous year's law, mass famine set in across the British Isles as crops failed. By 1820, petitions began to flood into Parliament demanding an abolition of the Corn Laws and a new policy of free trade. But the Prime Minister at the time, Lord Liverpool, who actually claimed to be in favor of free trade, blocked the petition. The excuses used by supporters of the Corn Laws to keep the policy in place are the same ones that are usually used to justify protectionism. For instance, if the Corn Laws were repealed, the agricultural sector would collapse. Or how about repeal would mean Britain would be dependent on overseas food imports. Or finally, such a repeal would reduce wages and maximize profits for manufacturers and other commercial interests. That last argument was one shared by the socialist Chartist movement and even Karl Marx. And here's the part about politics making for strange bedfellows. Because despite decades of failure, with the poor often being the hardest hit by rising food prices, it was socialists working in conjunction with the landed gentry to keep the corn laws in place. Frustrated by an inability to repeal the laws, the Anti-Corn Law League was founded to advocate for an end of the law and adoption of more free trade policies. But it wasn't until the Irish potato famine that the government was forced to act. In the face of mass starvation in Ireland, which cost the small island over 20% of its population through death and immigration, Prime Minister Robert Peel, once a staunch opponent of repealing the Corn Laws, finally crossed the aisle to vote for repeal in 1846. The act resulted in Peel being thrown out of office by his own party just four days later. Now, it may be hard to imagine how such a destructive law could stay on the books for three decades, until you consider that there were actually a lot of powerful interests that benefited from the protectionism. Socialists gained support among the people working in domestic agriculture. Wealthy landowners benefited by being able to charge more for their product than the marketplace would have otherwise allowed. As for everyone else hurt by the law, the socialists could claim that it was due to greed, while the landed gentry could claim that it was the patriotic duty to protect domestic industry. The benefits of the Corn Laws were concentrated in the hands of a few powerful interests that fought to keep the laws in place, while the costs were dispersed among the many who were either too busy, too hungry, or too removed from the situation to effectively advocate. In the end, the debate over the Corn Laws is very similar to many of the modern political debates we have today, where groups that are seemingly at odds with one another lock arms to advocate for policies which enrich themselves, usually at the expense of everybody else.